I invite you to open up your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. Open up your Bible to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, starting today in verse 38, Matthew 27, 38. I wish we could be together as we study this passage, as we have for the last 76 messages in this series. But we in the providence of God are not together this weekend, so I'm recording this video message which I hope will help us to understand and apply Matthew 27 to our lives. At least we get to return to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew is a theological biography of the most compelling person who has ever lived, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been following Jesus through the Gospel of Matthew, and for the last several months, we've been following Jesus through that last crucial holy week of his passion. And now we've reached the last day of that last week, and now the last hours. And you know what I've been saying again and again as we study Matthew 27? It just gets worse. It just gets worse. When we were together in Matthew last, our Lord was crucified. He has been betrayed, arrested, bound, deserted, tried, denied, beaten, spit upon, slapped, toyed with, condemned, tried again by the Romans, shouted at, scourged, stripped, mocked, struck, and now crucified. He's been hung on a cross, nailed to a, a cross beam up in the air so that he either pulls himself up so that he can breathe in excruciating pain or he slumps back down so that he can't breathe and is asphyxiated. And he does that again and again and again. And it just gets worse. How can it get worse, you might ask? I'll tell you. On top of being crucified, Jesus continues to be insulted and mocked while he hangs there. And the ones mocking him echo the words of Satan from the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. They call into question Jesus' very identity. They mock the very idea of his identity. Let me read to you Matthew 27, verses 38 through 40. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. Do you hear it? The words of the tempter, the words of Satan. If you are the Son of God, that's exactly what Satan said to Jesus in the wilderness. And again, we've come back to the question that has guided our study of Matthew all along. Who is Jesus? How many times have we said, keep your eye on the ball, right? Matthew always wants to demonstrate for us who Jesus really is. We know who Jesus really is, but these people sure didn't believe it. Jesus is crucified between two criminals. They might have been rebels against Rome. In the words of Isaiah 53, Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. And the bystanders, the passers-by, hurl insults at him. They shake their heads. Can you imagine just how shameful this was? And how painful? I'm sure they didn't realize it, but they were fulfilling Psalm 22, verse 7, which says, All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament scripture right before their eyes. And it's painful. I have three points about what it means for Jesus to truly be the Son of God according to this passage of Holy Scripture. And here's the first one. If you are truly the Son of God, you don't save yourself. You don't save yourself. So these mockers have it all wrong, which is ironic. They say, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Well, no, not saving himself is destroying the temple of his body. And in three days, it will be rebuilt. 
But if he were to save himself now, coming down from the cross, and he could have, he still has the power, he still has the authority. If he were to save himself now, he would have lost us. We would be lost forever. So they're calling his sonship into question. But Jesus is living out his divine sonship right before their eyes. This is what it looks like to be the Son of God, hanging there on the cross. Friends, things are not always as they seem. Sometimes when things seem at their worst, and they can be truly awful, they, there are all kinds of wonderful things actually going on. Great good can come from great evil and suffering. As I record this video, we are in the midst of a global health crisis, and we are being asked to isolate ourselves from others. And that's hard. It's hard. And the news has dreadful things in it. People dying. People suffering. The suffering is real, but it is not the whole story. God has good purposes for all the suffering that his children go through. He will work it all to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. God will use this time of trial with all of its suffering to bring himself glory and his people good. Just watch. We know that because he was doing it on this terrible day. This day was the worst day ever, but what do we call it? Good Friday. Good Friday. The worst crime ever committed was the crucifixion of the Son of God, and it was also the greatest gift. Because Jesus did not save himself. Jesus did not save himself. I'm sure he was tempted. He could still have called down 72,000 flaming soldier angels from heaven to rescue him. But he didn't. Because he knew who he was. He knew what his father had said about him at his baptism. He knew what his father had said about him at the transfiguration. His father had said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And Jesus knew what he had to do because he had said to his father in the garden, Not my will, but your will be done. It wasn't just the bystanders who mocked him in this way. It was the religious leaders who had been his enemies for several years. Look with me at verse 41. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. As if. They would never believe in him. They had refused to believe in him from day one. These are the men that Jesus called the fakes and the snakes. These are the ones who condemned him that morning in that mockery of a trial. And now they are mocking his claims to save people. What a joke, they say. Verse 43, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Yes, he is. He is the son of God. And he is saving people right now, right now by not saving himself. And they unwittingly fulfill another verse from Psalm 22, verse 8. The mockers there say, he trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. That's the opposite of what is true. There will be no rescue for Jesus because he's the son of God. Because he's the Son of God, and he is doing what only the Son of God can do. And it just gets worse. Look at verse 44. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Even the criminals are abusing Jesus. And it just gets worse. It's going to just keep getting worse until it's all over. Verse 45. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. That's from about noon to three. The brightest time of the day has become the darkest. This is a supernatural darkness. It's a judgment. It's like during the plagues of Egypt. 
This is no mere mortal who is dying here. A three-hour time of darkness rests on the land because of who is hanging on this cross. And it just gets worse. Verse 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what it means to be the Son of God. To have to say these words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. If you are truly the Son of God, you are forsaken by your God. That's point number two. If you are truly the Son of God, you are forsaken for a time by your God. Jesus is very intentionally quoting and fulfilling Psalm 22. This is the first verse of Psalm 22 in Hebrew and Aramaic. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Our Lord was living that question. He knew the answer. It wasn't an intellectual question that he was ignorant of the answer to. He was feeling this question. He was experiencing all the agony of this question. He was feeling all that it meant to be abandoned by God. All of the alienation, all of the pain, he was not spared any of it. Not only did he not save himself and come down from the cross, he opened himself up to the wrath of God. As the song says, our sin upon his shoulders. This is how bad sin is, friends. This is what it took because of our sin. This is what Jesus underwent for you and me. It puts our suffering into perspective, doesn't it? Our little light and momentary afflictions. Without pretending that our suffering isn't real or doesn't hurt, the worst thing that ever happens to us is nothing compared to what Jesus was going through for us. Jesus was forsaken so that we will never be forsaken. I will never leave you nor forsake you. There is a great mystery here because Jesus chose this. And theologically, we know that the Trinity cannot be broken. But the Son of God, in His humanity, experienced the wrath of God for our sins. The Bible says, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. That's why. That's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because of what he was going through. Because he is the Son of God. Have you put your faith in him? Have you turned around and put your trust in him? This is what it took for us to be saved. And it's free from anyone who will repent and believe. One more. If you truly are the Son of God, you are sovereign to the very end. That's point number three. If you are truly the Son of God, you are sovereign to the very end. We've seen again and again in the Gospel of Matthew, and especially in this last Holy Week, that Jesus is ultimately and mysteriously still in charge of all that's going on. None of this awfulness has taken him by surprise. In fact, in some mysterious way, it has all been according to his plan. That doesn't take away the blame from anyone. Not from Judas, not from the Jews, not from Pilate and the Romans, and not from us. But Jesus has also not given up his sovereignty either. Jesus is royal and regal even when he suffers. His cross is a throne. Let me say that again. His cross is a throne. Jesus has been lifted up and he is reigning even as he is dying. The people heard him yell out, Eloi, Eloi, and they didn't understand him. Verse 47, when some of them standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got him a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. 
The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Locking him to the end. And here is the end. And Jesus knows it's the end. And he chooses it. We have killed him. But he is sovereign to the very end. Look at verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. He laid down his life for us, and he gave up his spirit. I have good news for you now. It doesn't get any worse than this. This is as bad as it gets. And from here on, it gets better. Next week, Lord willing, we'll see how. Right now, I want to leave you with a question. How will you apply the truth of this passage to your life this week? How will you apply the truth of this passage to your life this week? Because it makes all the difference. What difference will it make to you? Because Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus didn't save himself, but he gave himself up for us all. He was forsaken on the cross by his God. And he was sovereign to his very last breath. What difference will that make for you today, for the next seven days, for the rest of your life, and for eternity? Praise Jesus that he is the Son of God.